indicating that you go out and, and take uh, mineral supplements for the most part, all living systems use most of these metals, and since almost all the food you eat was once living, you're getting a distribution of metals that you need for the most part. If you have a genetic allele that causes you to absorb less or more of one metal, then there needs to be some management. And that's the, 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 the discovery work that needs to continue to go on. We only have a sample of those types of disorders. So I'm going to talk today um, about particularly about zinc. I'm going to tell you about some of the insights we have gleaned from our working on copper. Much of our work was uh, inspired by the great biology of, of iron diseases, um, but I'm really going to focus on those three. I, I will point out that we're, we're going to start talking about the difference in the chemistry of this part of the territory or this part and this part, so your general chemistry question is not yet over. So these are the kind of fundamental questions I want to run through in fairly quick order. Um, they're kind of a, a list that you might have if you're asking well if, if metals and, and elements have to be acquired by cells. These are some of the questions you'd want to, to know. Is, is, are, are these really trace substances? As many of the textbooks would define zinc, copper, and iron uh, as not being very much in the body. And, okay, so is that true? How much is there for cell? And is that trace concept really useful? Then the question is, do they randomly accrue metals, or is there a very carefully balanced set point for how much age metal there is in the cell? And that's where I'm going. And I tell you, this is a very tightly regulated ratio of all the different elements, and we see very few deviations until cells start going to very specific differentiation states, and then click on new kids the rules. So we're talking about how they sense metals. Then the question of one is chemical speciation. I think most of you recognize that the iron can be a plus two iron, it can be a plus three iron, it can be an aqueous complex with a small molecule, it can be down tightly in an iron sulfur cluster in an enzyme. And so, you know, the question of, of how many of these is, how much is free or available, I'm going to show you how that can be a really important part of our thinking. Um, and then, if there's a lot of metals, then I'm going to try to convince you that from a cell biology point of view, from a cellular point of view, it's hard to say something at all. But if there's so much of it, how does the right metal get to the right address in the cell? And uh, we've made some progress on this, but there's a huge amount of distance to go. And then, most of these questions are ones that a, a chemist has measured, and, and, and now especially with uh, extracting better and better physical methods from the, from the physical and uh, uh, community the physical sciences instrumental methods of synchrotron, we can actually get down to counting how many metals are in a cell. But those are really kind of snapshots. The question is, can we look over time and look at a time sequence and see how, from the lifetime of the cell, these um, metals might flux between compartments, be inside and outside the cell, and how those movements, those flux of the metal, actually might perform critical switching roles uh, in cell physiology. So, um, Karen Alton, when she was in my laboratory, uh, developed a, a really clever way to think of uh, the abundance of metals themselves. And there's a lot of ways to measure This is one of them. This is an ICTMS that heats the sample up to the surface temperature of the sun and then counts the ions that, uh, that come off. It can be down to parts per trillion in sensitivity. There's a number of manufacturers. Uh, and when she did, she took all those numbers and then she divided the number of atoms by Avogadro's number and by the volume of the cell. And this happens to be a bacterium that's closer that was growing up in a minimal media and where the metal concentrations were kept very low. The transition metals in here were kept at around 10 nanomoles. And in spite of that, the bacteria grew up to about 0.1 to 0.5 million moles in terms of their total concentration. That's four orders of magnitude that they wish that iron was concentrated. It's not too surprising. We know a lot about iron scattering systems. But it was remarkable for us that zinc was almost neck and neck. And in fact, copper and manganese were always about an order of magnitude lower. As, as we've gone on and taken these results to the next stage, we've asked, is that something unique to bacteria, or, or do other cells do the same thing? And here's the numbers I showed you before, where we're just plotting the total amount of metals versus the total volume on uh, the log plot. And what you see is that yeast, which are much bigger, and that mouse cells, which again are much larger, log eggs, chick eggs, etc. But there's this continuity, there's kind of a signature of these cells, most of which are undifferentiated, um, and that there's around 0.5 million molar of zinc and of iron in those cells. And this is still towards me today. But there is such a high concentration. If I dissolve solutions of iron and zinc at those, uh, at those concentrations, you see it precipitate the, the metals that react and they, they want to fall out of solution. So the uh, cells are spending a great deal of energy to concentrate. And there's just a, a kind of a baseline that I want you to keep in mind as we go through the lecture. It's also remark more remarkable that copper is about an order of magnitude too well. So those of you that know the kind of the genetic lineage or the evolutionary lineage of these, what I find this even more surprising because there's a big difference in the number of types of metallic enzymes and the metabolic pathways 